Good evening, saints. Greetings in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the 30th of March, 2022, and we're thankful to God for His grace and mercy upon our lives constantly. The third month of the year is just past, and uh, time is flying. Things are moving in the world. Uh, lots of things happening overseas in our own country. The economic pressures are rising, and... Uh, We've been saying this for many years. The events that are taking place are proving Bible prophecies come to pass. But more so in the last few days, in the last few months, um, we have seen more than we've ever seen before. And that it is getting closer to the things that the book of Revelations was speaking about. So it's a very good time for us to be talking about this book. The book of Revelations and our series is how to read the book of Revelations. And those of you who've been following from the introduction two weeks ago will understand why we are getting into this. So this is part two, the salutation of the book. And we're going to take our scripture reading from Revelations 1 and verse 4 to 5. Hopefully we'll deal with just these two verses, actually verse 4 and then one phrase from verse 5. Revelations 1, verse 4 to 5. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace, from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. The Lord add a blessing to his word. So, we said the title will be the salutation of the book. And that's what we want to talk about first, salutation. Uh, this section of the book of Revelations is called the salutation of the book. You need to get used to that phrase because it has to be discussed for every church age because there was a salutation for every age. And when we think of today, we don't use the word salutation very much. If you ask the French people, they will understand it a little bit more and some of the uh, languages from Europe, probably uh, Spanish and Italian and so on, because salute means something to them. Whereas today, if you had to use the word salute in South Africa or in the United Kingdom or in America or something like that, you, you would generally Assume salute means to raise your hand to your forehead to um, greet an army officer or something of that because that's what salute has come to mean to us today. But salutation is a greeting. To salute someone means to greet them. And then you think, well, what's such a big deal about that? For us today, a salutation is a friendly hi or hello, how are you? In those days, a salutation was a very important thing, crucial. It was a custom that was so well kept that if it wasn't done, nobody would pay attention to you or something wouldn't be read because it was deemed unimportant. So if a document did not have a salutation, if a letter did not have a salutation, it was almost an insult to someone. And if it didn't have a salutation, it would be deemed non-conforming to customs of that time and they would just scrap the letter and throw it away. No matter how important something was in there, the salutation was a very important custom. And so that's why it is actually in the beginning of this book of Revelations. Uh, so in the old days, you couldn't come into a king's palace without bringing salutations. If you didn't have salutations, you would be sent away. And then once you came into the king's court, you would have to be introduced. So you'd have to have credentials. So in our days, we say, well, you know, my name is Alistair Francis and here's my ID number and this is who I am, you know. So people are more interested in your identity number. Um, and your name and surname, and that seems to be sufficient for people. But in those days, it would be, uh, this is Alistair Francis, son of Stephen Jennifer Francis. And if my parents were some 
duke and duchess or something like that or somebody important or they would say you know duke and duchess of some place in newcastle and owners of this property and um, some and all the titles and credentials that they have and then followed by which they would show my credentials and he is of this and this and this background and he owns this and this and this county and this land and this belongs to him they would so the introduction of who I am uh, would be a long list of words so that when I come into the king's court, he knows exactly who he's speaking to, which means just saying Alistair Francis and your ID number is not an identification enough when you come and stand before a king. So also when you are producing a document that needs to be read, You need a proper identification because whoever is going to read that document or whoever is going to read whatever it is you wrote or hear what you have to say, they want your background. And of course, the reason for that is interpretation of what is read or heard is affected by the revelation of who is writing it or saying it. Right? And that's what's important about this. So in those days... It was a custom that was so well kept uh, that if it wasn't done, nobody would pay attention to you, like we said. And if you brought your document or your book and it had no salutation, they would think this is not important enough because it, it doesn't have a salutation. So therefore, it's from somebody who's not really important. So throw it away. But then there were important reasons why those salutations were used as we have just expressed. A salutation tells us two things. And this is why, oh, what we have to focus on right now. Two things. Who the book is addressed to and who the book is from. In other words, so if, if, we, were, if we lived in the old days and I met up with you, I would salute you with I, Alistair Francis, greet you, whatever your name is, with, and I give some description of something. In there is identified the sender of the message and the receiver. So who the book is addressed to and who the book is from. The significance of a salutation in the context of the book of Revelation, right? So without the knowledge or revelation of who is giving out the word or writing the book, it is impossible to properly interpret what is written. So for example, a letter between two people, okay? A letter between a husband and wife or between two friends. That letter will consist of things that only the sender and the receiver can properly understand. Now, you may read a letter between a husband and a wife or between two friends and you will gather some things that you will understand. But the, there's greater meaning, the intentions, the, the intonations of the, of the way it is spoken. You will not know significant details that gives you the actual message in the mind of the person. You will not be able to grasp that. What you will do is you will interpret those words from your point of view and most likely will misinterpret the words altogether. You remember the prophet saying that when he received a letter from his wife while he was abroad and he read what she had to say and he could understand his wife's letters properly. He said, if you read it, you wouldn't know what she's saying. But because I know her, he said, I could read between the lines. So the sender will write things specifically for the receiver to understand. Why is that important? Because when a letter in the old days was addressed to somebody and it was spoken of who it was from, um, anyone who's delivering the letter could open that letter up, crack open the seal, look at the letter, read it, and know what was going on. But if 
the sender and receiver were properly identified, anyone who reads the letter knows that the only way they're going to get the proper message or the proper intention or the proper result is if this letter reaches the receiver who was addressed in there. And that would mean that that's the only time the revelation of it all will be made known. So the sender will write things specifically for the receiver to understand. Because the receiver knows the sender so well, he or she will never misinterpret anything and will totally understand everything. The book of Revelations is then written in a way that only those who have a revelation of the saluter will understand. Amen. So that being said, it means this. Those who read the book of Revelations and know who the writer is, who understand, who have a revelation of Christ, only they will properly understand the book of Revelations. Nobody else. It is impossible to understand unless you get into the spirit of the writer. You know, if you study English poetry or literature, they teach you that. You know, you've got to research the writer if, you, if you're studying Shakespeare or, you know, some, some uh, writer from the past. Uh, and you have to study the person, the conditions of the time they were writing from, the conditions of an experiences that prompted that person to write those very things. In the study of literature, they expect you to do that research to be able to understand why they wrote what they wrote. So that is what is called getting into the spirit of the writer. It is very important to understand the purpose for the salutation because, like we said, every age of the church begins with a salutation to the age. You'll see that. Unto the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that... That's called a salutation that identifies the church and the sender. A salutation invokes the attention of the reader or the receivers of the word to look at the written or spoken word from the direction of the salutation. That means what is most important is you could read, let's say you read the message that was sent to Ephesus. And you're here in Laodicea. You're never going to understand what was meant, what message was transferred to the the church age of Ephesus, unless you begin with the salutation and see what anointing the Spirit is invoking. If he says, These things saith he who hath the sword in his hand, or the sword comes out of his mouth, or these things saith he who hath the seven stars in his hand, or these things saith he, then what he's saying is, you need to read this message knowing that I am the one who has the seven stars, or I am anointing this age with this particular anointing. So if you don't read that message with that particular anointing, you are not going to get the correct understanding that he was going to give to that age. I hope that's easy to understand. All right, so let's get to the breakdown of the salutation. In verses 4 to 5, we see firstly, there are two salutations to the seven churches from what seems like four different sources or people who are saluting. Right? Two different salutations to the seven churches and from what seems like four different sources. And we'll explain that just now. You'll also see in verses four to five, three major ands, A-N-D-S. Now, you know, the word and is a conjunction. What a conjunction does is it joins two different sentences to make one sentence in English. So what we're saying is uh, there are three major ends. They're very, very important. And then there are five minor ones, which are not exactly important, right? And we're going to look at those three major ends. So let me just give you an example. If I read 
the verses there. It says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you. And there's your first major and. So it's and peace from him which is. Here's a minor and. And which was. And which is to come. Now here's a major and. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And verse 5. And another major and from Jesus Christ. So if you read further on in verse 5, you see all the other minor ants. But basically, what this is doing is separating four things, four sources or people. These three major ants are joining four uh, sources of people who are bringing salutations, people or four sources, right? So, to read it out plainly to you, it says, Grace be unto you, which seems to be from John, and peace from he which was and is and is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ. Right? So, this is very important, and we're going to pick that up just now. So, remember that. Now, we get to the next point. Uh, we want to pass by this. That's why we're doing this first. Who the book is to. And you find there in verse 4, it is to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, what does that mean? Okay. So, these are the seven cities of Asia Minor. This is not Asia that we know of today. That would have probably been called Asia Major. So, Asia would be... China and um, India and Japan, Pakistan and some of those countries that are in this massive continent that which we call Asia today. But Asia Minor was the absolute western part of Asia. And it was a small section which today we call the country of Turkey. And in there were many cities, many important cities, including Nicaea. But the seven cities that John was inspired to speak to were Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. They were spelled slightly different, like Pergamon, not exactly Pergamos. Uh, so, and some of them were just as they are in the book of Revelation. Historically, there were churches, there were churches within these cities, which were known by John and they were significant symbols of the growth of the church through the ages that were to come, right? And that's why they were used. So these churches were chosen as symbols by Christ because they had characteristics that were going to accurately manifest the effect of the seed of the word being planted. Remember what we told you? The book of Revelation is a map it's, it's a guideline of all that would occur when the seed of Christ is planted in anything. The world, the church, a human. It tells exactly what is going to happen, as in how it will begin, what the, the road map will be, what the enemies will be, what um, the positives will be, what the negatives will be, what will come against them, how there will be redemption, all of that. It's the roadmap. All right, so these seven churches were chosen as symbols that were included in the roadmap of the church, in the growth of the church. How the church would begin, how it would progress, how it would digress, how it would come to the judgment, how it would be restored in the end. All right, so bear that in mind. So who is it to? The seven churches in Asia or rather the seven church ages of the Gentile dispensation. That's the revelation of the symbols. Now we get to, you know, the, the greeting is simply grace and peace. Right, so grace seems to be the greetings from John. John to the seven church ages, grace. And peace from, right, from the next three sources. So it is important to notice that John spent only one verse, not even one verse, like uh, one phrase 
as a greeting from himself. The majority of the greeting is from Christ in the following verses. And you're going to see that probably next week when we get through the rest of verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. So, grace in this context means good tidings or well wishes. So, John is saying to the seven churches in Asia, I wish you good tidings or or well wishes to you. And then he says, and peace, right? That and in between grace and peace is a major and because it is grace from John and peace from whoever is coming after that, right? So peace is a beautiful part of this salutation. Peace means harmony or balance. Now, <laughs> who would greet someone with peace today? I mean, you walk around and you meet a brother from the church and you stand there and say, Hey, Brother John, peace. Oh, Brother Peter, be peace, you know, peace to you. And they'll look at you weirdly because nobody walks around saying that nowadays. However, if you walked around and said, Shalom, the message believers would probably understand what you mean. They'll say they'll think you're coming from the context of a message, Shalom, spoken by the prophet. Other people were hearing you thinking, hmm, if they looked at me saying shalom, they'd, they'd see an Indian man. They'll say, hmm, an Indian man using a Jewish uh, greeting. That's weird. These people are weird. Let's move on. Uh, s- nobody does that anymore. Peace, shalom. You find amongst the Muslim people, they say salam. And uh, they're so used to it, it's tradition, but it's so useless with Muslim people because they it's just a greeting. It's just salam to them is a hi, hello. I, I actually hear some of them casually just saying salams, you know. And it's the meaning of that has been lost to them. Uh, and it's it, it was a thing of the East. Like you will find amongst the Indians, they put, depending on whether they Tamil or Hindi or whatever, they put their hands together they bring it together in front of their chest and they say Namaste or Namaskaram in the different Indian languages. And uh, again, the people of this world, this modern world, do it all the time. Namaste and Namaskaram, but they have no idea what it actually means. To them, it's just a greeting. Originally, those words, Namaste, Namaskaram, Salam, Shalom, they come from the Eastern world which meant one thing. It means, let our minds come together. That was a greeting between people. Let our minds come together. Now, this was, again, something that is written in the Bible. And when you read that, I I guarantee you how many times you've read that scripture and you pass over that peace from He, which is, which was, and which is to come. And you pass by, oh right, he said peace, fantastic, you know, whatever that is. I believe that John was giving the most important salutation from the author. Peace is not just harmony or balance. That's us interpreting peace. If I ask you what peace means, you would say, well, it means no war, no fighting. It means I come in peace. What does that mean? You know, that doesn't mean anything. I come in peace. What were we expecting you to come fighting with a bow and arrow or a spear and a sword? What do you mean by? In those days, peace meant I am one with you. Let our minds come together. Let us be of one mind. Right? That was oneness. It's what we call oneness. And that oneness, that I am one with you. I mean, could there be anything greater? Then he which was, which is, and which is to come, sending you a message of greeting saying, I am one with you. Can you see the greatness of that? That oneness, that unity was brought by the Holy Ghost. We know that. That means a a whole lot of things to us, right? But mostly that there would be a rest given to the true believer who received the Holy Ghost. Why rest? Because for a long time, humans were not one with God. They were not one mind with God. They were of two minds, constantly. But if this salutation says, Peace, 
it, the, from the sender, he's saying, I understand you. I'm with you. I, I am witnessing everything that happens to you. I uh, am experiencing everything that you go through. Peace. We are of one mind. We are one. We are together in this. We are united. The Holy Ghost is the salutation of peace from Christ to any believer. Then John expresses where the salutation of peace is coming from. Okay, so now we get to the four sources of the salutation. That means where the people that these salutations are coming from. The first one we get to is John himself. So verse 4 opens up with the name John. John to the seven churches, right? He, this phrase identifies John as the scribe who is saluting the seven churches. It is important that the book indicates that John was the scribe of this book. He's fir- he first expresses greetings from himself, but then he's invoking the blessings of the revelation of Jesus as manifested on earth and in heaven, right? That's what we're seeing. You'll see those, the next three sources are indications of Jesus in earth and in heaven. So is John that important for the salutation? I mean, why, does, why is his name important there? Is it important at all? Absolutely yes. Why? Because John is the one who wrote what he saw in the visions. We have to understand him. When you read the book of Revelations, you have to understand John. You have to read the book of John. You have to read the Gospels of John. Uh, the writings of John, the books of John. You need to know where he is coming from, what was his own personal anointing, because his own personal anointing affected how he wrote what he saw. It's very important that you know who John is and everything there is to know about him, or as much as you can. Right now, As we explained before, what John saw was not necessarily things that he was used to at his time, because He was seeing things of the future which had not happened yet or not even been invented yet. He was seeing governments, parliaments, churches, uh, world wars, plagues which never occurred, viruses which they had never discovered. He was seeing uh, machines that sailed the seas, that flew in the air, that moved in the ground. He saw things he never understood, right? I mean, kind of like Brother Branham in his day who was describing an egg-shaped car with uh, driverless with, uh, you know, kids playing a board game on the inside was something that never occurred yet in the prophet's day. So he couldn't tell you exact, exactly what it is. But when he said an egg-shaped car, you know, we don't even realize what he meant from that. From that, He could have just meant this car was so rounded because all the cars in Brother Branham's day was, were very box-like, square and angular. And yet when you look at the cars in our day, they're all so round and aerodynamic and curvy. And, you know, it's, and, and maybe that's all he meant. But we went around looking for, not we, the people who, who read that went around looking for a literal car shaped like a literal oval. And it's throwing you off when you try to do things that you're not spending time to understand the times and conditions from when something was spoken. Um, So it's very important. When God shows a prophet a vision, like when he said a woman will rule America, and then he thought it was an actual woman, and then as time went on, he he, he said it may not be an actual woman, it may actually be the church, the, the Catholic church, or it may be a system or something like that. Right, so it's very, very important to know the writer. So, um, it's important because what he knew of in his time was not necessarily what he understood of things that were going to happen because he wrote it, and because he wrote it, we are able to understand it because we know him, right? Also, what's important is noticing John's attitude to the visions. His attitude to each vision shows us the anointing and his reaction uh, to it. And by seeing his anointing and his reaction, it shows us what anointing and reaction we ought to have to the same visions. Because he symbolizes us, the bride. 
He's not the most important in the salutation because the thoughts are not his, but he symbolizes us, the bride. Therefore, he is significant to us, right? He was the one honored to receive the revelation of Jesus Christ in symbol form. This book is a book of symbols, Revelation's book of symbols, because Jesus loved him the most and preserved him to show him these secrets. Now, you can read in just one uh, chapter and a few verses, John thirteen twenty one to 29, you can see how um, when Jesus says something at the supper table and it disturbs him and Peter says, you know, who is it that he's talking about? And the disciples are looking around at themselves and then Peter gets the idea, why not ask John? Because clearly there's some, there's a extra care between Jesus and John. John was the youngest of all the disciples. He could have been a 19 or 20 year old, considered a child, whom Jesus showed special care for. He was, you know, for example, he could have been like Jesus' Sunday school. Um, he lay very close to Jesus at supper. And he was able to ask the thoughts that were troubling Jesus. And he divulged them to John. So Peter whispers to John to say, ask him who he's talking about. John asks him flat out who he's asking about. And then Jesus gives this statement. He who dips his uh, um, bread in the sop with, or dips in the sop with me at the same time that I do so, and so on. So this understanding of who John is is crucial to us because that's the relationship we ought to have with the word. That's telling us that when there's something that comes forth from the mysteries of God, if you are not one who lays on his bosom, you cannot ask him the most intimate questions. And when you're a reader, don't expect to understand revelation if you don't have an intimate revelation of Christ. Amen. So that's why John is important to us as the first source of salutation. Now the next part is one that will baffle Trinitarians, right? Because you could say the salutation comes from John and then it comes from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, why does this salutation look like it comes from three different people or 11 different people in heaven? Why you say 11? Well, it says, he which was, that could be one person. He which is, that could be another. He which is to come, that could be another. Then seven spirits before the throne. Three plus seven is ten. And then from Jesus Christ. That's eleven. So is that from eleven different people? Right? So he which is, which was, and is to come. And from seven spirits before the throne. And from Jesus Christ. Do you see how easy it is for someone who doesn't know the author to make this from many people, many sources, many entities? Right? The truth is, those who know him well understand these are not different people, but different manifestations of the same person over different times and seasons. Now, what this tells us is that only those with the correct understanding of Godhead can interpret this book correctly. So there's another starting point. You need to understand the Godhead properly before you get into this. When you start hearing things like the Father, uh, He who sits on the white horse, the true and faithful witness, um, the Son, the mighty angel descending, and you don't have an understanding of Godhead, you could easily make this two lords, three lords, three personalities in a Godhead. Right? The most important clue that the three sources of salutation which come after John are the same person is that they all have the same salutation. Peace. That tells us who it was because Christ left uh, earth saying this to the disciples. John fourteen twenty six to 27 But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Amen. So, 
this is literally saying that the peace that the world gives does not compare, right? So peace, now we want to talk about it. We said some a little bit about it earlier. Peace or shalom is a mystery that nobody understands today. And I'm, I'm, I'm 100% on this, that all the Eastern people of the world who use the phrases today have lost the effect of what that means. How do I know? Because people greet one another with shalom, salam, and they hate one another. They greet them, each other with namaste, namaskaram, all the Eastern uh, words, and they hate one another. They despise one another. They think evil of one another. If you say peace to somebody, you are saying, let our minds be united. You are saying, we are one. That's what you're saying. It's a greeting among all Abrahamic religions, but the significance has been lost on them. 4,000 years ago, when they greeted each other with greetings of peace, it meant, let our minds be united. In other words, we are one. But among men, that was only a promise. So even though they used it from 4,000 years ago, it was only a promise. Like, let's say when Abraham met with Lot. I'm just giving you an example. Probably didn't happen. But let's say they met after maybe seven weeks of not seeing each other and they say to each other, Shalom or peace. Right? At, at that moment, those two men were disagreeable because one went and took the plains of Jordan and the other one went in the other direction. After having split up and, you know, um, agreeing not to be a part of one another's uh, group anymore, they were, dis- they were in disagreement. So when they came together and they both greeted each other with shalom or peace, they were saying, let us hope to be of one accord in this meeting. Let us attempt, let us persevere to be one in spirit so that we can understand each other. So to them, to, among men, it was a promise, uh, like, a, like a, a promise being made to one another to do their best to reach an agreement. Get it? So that's why when Christ said, a peace the world could not give, I'm giving you peace, that the world could not give. That's because Christ is not making a, a, a promise of an attempt. He's telling you, I'm giving you peace. I'm giving you something that's literally going to make us one. Literally something that is going to put us in one mind. And he identifies it. He says, it's, it's the comforter. It's the Holy Ghost. That peace comes from Christ. That is the Holy Ghost that could literally baptize a person into the oneness of spirit into one body, right? So that a body of people could be so united with the Spirit of Christ, they would understand and believe the Word of Christ. Amen. So peace is the oneness of God, the unity of God. The unity, meaning of many-membered body, becoming one in revelation, in understanding, the true revelation of the Godhead. That's what the peace of God is. So, uh, we reach the second uh, source of the salutation. He which is, and which was, and which is to come. This is just beautiful. He which is, and which was, and which is to come. Basically, this is the revelation of the Word Himself expressed through time. Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, that's He which was, Today, He which is, and He which is to come forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Past, present, and future. This is the revelation of the Godhead. The Father was. Christ is. The Holy Ghost is to come. This is the revelation of Christ Himself. The first coming was. The Holy Ghost is. The second coming is to come. Right? That was how they saw it in the church ages. Then there is the revelation of the Messiah. Son of man was. Son of God is, if you are standing in the church ages. And son of David is to come for the millennium. This is also the revelation of God above, was. Emmanuel, God with us, is present. And God in us, which would be the future, if you were standing in the church ages. This is also the revelation of St. John 14.20. The Father in me, I in you, 
Oh, the Father in me, I in the Father, I in you, you in me. It is unity, peace, harmony. It is shalom. This is also a phrase that wherever you are in the Gentile ages of time, you can relate to the Lord Jesus who was, is, and is to come. In Paul's day, was was the word of the apostles he was trying to kill. Paul himself was trying to kill. Right? Is became the word of Paul's day, which came through Paul himself. And is to come was the word that was going to come in Irenaeus' day. In Wesley's day, if, <clears throat> if Wesley was standing there and thinking, well, he which was, that would be Luther. He which is, is the word through Wesley. And he that is to come, the word of the seventh messenger. Right? If you were standing in Wesley's day. So also in your personal life, you can identify the word himself in your past, the word in your present, the word in your future. That is, what called you, what is sustaining you right now, and what you will become when you fulfill the fullness of the word for your day. That means every single believer has a way of interpreting or has a viewpoint of he which is, which was, and is to come. Glory to God. Amen. Then we get to the third one, which is the seven spirits before the throne. These are the seven anointings that will bring the influence to the seven messengers over the seven church ages of the Gentile dispensation. Right? Uh, so, you, you understand what that means, right? Those messengers were just men. Um, they had their flaws. They had their mistakes. But these seven spirits before the throne would be anointings of Christ himself that would anoint each messenger. Now these seven anointings will influence the messengers with characteristics of the sevenfold glory of the person of Christ, which we will talk about in a few services to come. And the, the, that, that revelation of that sevenfold glory of that person, if it was one fold of it coming to one messenger, it would give that messenger a particular ability to face the challenge of that age and deliver the revelation of the day to the people. Right, so these seven spirits before the throne are not seven separate angels that are not Jesus Christ. They are anointings, spirits, the angels of Jesus Christ himself. Angel is a messenger of a particular thing, right? So you can read here in the Revelation of Jesus Christ, that is your church age book, uh, page 17, paragraph 3. He says, the seven spirits before the throne is the spirit that was in each of the seven messengers, giving them their ministries for the age in which each lived. On page 248, paragraph 5, Sardisian Church Age, he says, Thus we know that the seven spirits of God mean it is the one and same spirit coming forth in a sevenfold way. These seven spirits are found to be associated with man. On page 250, paragraph 2, Sardisian Church Age. So we see that the seven spirits actually refer to the one Spirit of God working out the will and word of God in different generations. See, I didn't make that up. It's exactly what the messenger said. All right, so we clear that up. It's not seven different people. It's one spirit broken up into seven manifestations over seven church ages, through seven messengers. There it is. Now, think about that. You are being saluted from that manifestation. What does that mean? You can't read the book of Revelations without understanding that. You have to read the book of Revelations with that direction of thought of those seven anointings. Okay. And you know, I, I might as well give you the spoiler. <laughs> You'll find all the mysteries of God in the book of Revelations are separated into sevens. Seven church ages, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven seals, seven thunders, right? Major doctrines. In the Old Testament, seven feasts and more and more sevens. So we're not making things up. Seven golden candlesticks, seven stars in his right hand. Seven spirits before the throne, lamps burning before the throne, seven candlesticks in the time of uh, Moses, uh, seven eyes moving 
uh, through the earth in Zechariah. It's all their sense, right? It's, it's not something we made up. So number four brings us to the end Jesus Christ. So peace be unto you, from, or peace from, he which is, he which was, and, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits of God before the throne, and from Jesus Christ. And to me, this is the most beautiful salutation coming from the most beautiful expression of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to us? Now the usual reflex is, oh yes, everyone knows this. Jesus Christ is the Lord who came 2,000 years ago. Glory to God. He crucified on, on Calvary, shed his blood for our sins. Praise be to God for Jesus so loved the world. You know, and oh, God so loved the world, he gave his only son, and so on and so on. In Revelations, book of symbols, Jesus is not just a person. He is a symbol of something. He's not just the one who died 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ represents not just one person in history, but a particular manifestation. What is the revelation of Jesus Christ? Right? Look, we broke down which is, which was, which is to come. We broke down seven spurs before the throne. How do we break down Jesus Christ? What is Jesus Christ? A particular manifestation that nothing else has ever manifested in the history of man, in the history of what we know of as God. Jesus Christ represents the Word made flesh, born of a woman and dwelling among men. John 1, 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. Now, we know the Word was made flesh in Abraham's day and that was called Melchizedek. That was a different manifestation of God, of the same God. But he was not called the Son. He was Melchizedek. He was not born of a woman. Right? Jesus Christ represents the manifestation of the Word in flesh that was born, not of the will of man, but of God, and born of a woman. This is why it's so important to us. Right? Jesus Christ represents He who would bring many sons like unto himself. Amen. That they may also be Jesus Christ in their day. What? What? Yes. That they may also be the word made flesh, born of a woman, not of the will of man, but of the will of God. That's what Jesus Christ represents. And uh, so he would be the Christ in their day, right? Who would bring sons like unto himself, that they may also be Christ in their day according to their measure, until there would come a day where they would be fully adopted sons who would be fully Jesus Christ in the last day, the full stature of that perfect man. Then, Jesus Christ also represents Adam, who was the beginner of a new race. Who was Adam? Adam was made up of two parts, a masculine part, and a feminine part. Is that right? Let us make man in our image. And he made man male and female. Male and female created he them in the day that they were created. And he called their name Adam. You remember that. That's just mixing up several scriptures. In the first Adam, he was created male and female in the day that they were created. And they were both called Adam. Both male and female were called Adam. They were then separated in Genesis 2 when Adam was made flesh and she was called woman because she came out of man. But she was still called Adam. Her name was called Adam, right? When she fell because of sin, she received a new identification. She was no longer called Adam. She was called Eve, the mother of all living. She lost the name Adam. She needed restoration. In the second Adam, he was born, Jesus Christ, having the potentials of his bride in him. At Calvary, he shed his blood so that his seed could be released upon the Gentiles to gather his bride to him. She was already fallen before she knew him, and she was called sinners. But when she was gathered from all kindreds, nations, tongues, and peoples by the blood, by the Holy Ghost, and a portion of the word for, her, for that day, she was called church, the church. But the promise was 
that in the last days he would return with the full word he would return with the full word and unite with the perfect church that is the bride and she would be called Jesus Christ just like the original feminine part of Adam was called Adam this second Adam she would be called Jesus Christ what is that the word made flesh born of a woman not of the will of man but of the will of God and dwelling among men that's what it means to be Jesus Christ that is the coming of Jesus Christ you cannot read this book of revelations without understanding and accepting that revelation of who Jesus Christ is no one who reads the book of revelations without this understanding of who salutes the churches will properly understand or appreciate the treasures inside this book saints in fact most Christians will not know it. Many message people will not know it because they do not accept what the message really is. The reason they don't is that they only see Jesus Christ as an historical figure who saved us from our sins by his shed blood. They do not see the mystery of God revealed in Jesus Christ. To them, Jesus Christ is just a, the one who came 2,000 years ago, who died, shed his blood for our sins, and who is coming back. That's what they think Jesus Christ is. But that's not the one that is saluting the seven churches. They do not see the mystery of God revealed in Jesus Christ and the glory of God expressed in His bride through Jesus Christ. They don't accept it because they don't believe it is possible. They don't believe it is possible for them to play that part of being Jesus Christ. They can't see it. Satan has got them because they feel unworthy, they feel unable, and they feel like he's got to do all the work and that we must just wait for him to do what he said he would do and keep up, you know, doing whatever scripture said we must do. Therefore, they miss the most glorious and most important part of the mystery of Christ. All hell is against this truth. Amen. Christ is the mystery of God revealed page 489 he says it goes right by them and they don't recognize it till it's gone it only picks up the predestinated seed that God predestinated before the foundation of the earth the same thing come through in the days of Noah same thing come through in the days of Moses days of Elijah days of the prophets days of Jesus on down through and to this very hour the pregnated person with the seed of God the word in them manifesting itself is so surrendered to the will of God that the Word and the Word alone manifests itself in this person, the prisoner to an individual. Not say, my church, now my church. My church has nothing to do with it, he says. It's an individual, one person. All hell is against this teaching, he says. Again, he says, all hell is against this truth. But it is the truth. This is Christ is the mystery of God revealed saints. Paragraph 492. Jesus never said, Now, Peter, you and John and all the rest of the people, you've got the revelation, now the whole church is saved. No. It was to him personally. I say unto thee, thee, not to them, to thee, thou art Peter. Upon this rock I'll build my church. And the word Peter means a stone. Stone means the confessed one or the separated one. 494. Upon a certain stone, upon a certain thing, see, I called out the church, called out upon the stone, upon this revelation. Flesh and blood had never revealed it to you, but upon this revelation, this called out group, I'll build my church in them, and all the gates of hell will never be able to withstand it. 495. Not one hair of your head shall perish. You are mine. I'll raise you up in the last day. Give unto him eternal life and raise him up at the last days. There it is, the revelation. Not them, but him, an individual. Not a group, an individual. All hell is against it. Last paragraph. But his mystery is only revealed to his beloved bride. That's the only one that could see it. Glory be to God. Amen. So in closing, saints... When you're reading Revelations 1, 4 to 5, 
and you read this. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. It should read like this. Verse 4. I, John, direct this book to the seven future church ages, symbolized by the seven cities of Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. Send greetings of goodwill and good wishes to you. And I carry the message, we are one, which should bring rest, joy of salvation, in the thought that you are acknowledged and known of from he who is the one who revealed himself to us today through his word, the same one who led your fathers of the past and who is the one you are looking forward to redeem us all when he comes as he promised and from the seven anointings that express the sevenfold glory of his person that holds the revelation of himself for every age and from the word who was made flesh and dwelt among us born of a woman not of the will of man but of the will of God who promised to make us sons like unto his own glorious self and nurture us until we grow into his own image to be him in the last day. Glory to God. May the Lord bless you, saints. Have a wonderful evening with your families. Until the next time, God bless you.